I thus address the world through the medium of the latest wonderful invention so that my voice, like my great show, will reach future generations and be heard centuries after I have joined the great and, as I believe, happy majority. Welcome to Becoming Barnum, the journey to fame and fortune, a podcast presented by the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The Barnum Museum has a unique treasure in its collection, a 750-page copybook of letters written by Phineas Taylor Barnum when he was traveling in Europe in the 1840s, introducing his young protege, General Tom Thumb, to millions of ordinary people, as well as royalty and high society. These letters offer a unique glimpse into the life of P.T. Barnum as a husband, father, mentor, and entrepreneur. Join us as we travel back in time and learn about the real person behind the legendary P.T. Barnum through his own words. If you enjoy this episode, we would appreciate it if you would subscribe to our podcast to help our rankings and support the Barnum Museum. And now, on with the show. I entrust you with a small secret. As we draw toward the end of P.T. Barnum's copybook, it is fitting that there are several letters in which he discusses returning to America. And, in true Barnum fashion, the plan had a twist. After such a long time abroad, Barnum was more than ready to set foot on his home turf again, and this desire was amplified by continued worry over his wife Charity's health. As of April 3, 1846, Barnum still did not know about the arrival of their fourth daughter, Pauline, who was born on March 1st. He was rightfully upset that no one had written to give him any news. Transatlantic mail delivery at the time was such that he should have received letters in about two weeks' time. Yet there he was in early April, uninformed. Surely his widowed sister Cordelia, who was living in the Bridgeport household, could have sent him a line or two. Perhaps the absence of correspondence from charity or from relatives or friends prompted his decision to return without letting them know of his plan. He dearly wanted it to be a surprise and decided to share the secret with only one person in America. The visit home would just be for a few weeks, however, not the conclusion of the European tour with General Tom Thumb. In various of Barnum's letters dating to the fall of 1845 and winter of 1846, we've seen him give conflicting information about when he intended to go to America. The danger inherent in crossing the Atlantic in the depth of winter was a major deterrent, but even aside from a risk he wanted to avoid, it is clear that the lure of staying in England to make more money was also tugging at him. And there was the matter of his business partner, Sherwood Stratton, who, as usual, was less than cooperative. The plan Barnum finally came up with, to go home for a brief visit but keep it secret, was deployed on March 31, 1846, when he wrote letters to Fortis Hitchcock, his museum manager, and to the captain of the Great Western Steamship, the vessel he planned to be on. Barnum's letter to Hitchcock sets him up to remain unsuspecting of an imminent return, while the other letter gets the travel plan underway and reveals the deception to the captain. Barnum wrote to tell Hitchcock that things were really going quite well in London. The general was giving daily levies at Egyptian Hall in Piccadilly, and at night he was performing the new play by Albert Smith, Hop O' My Thumb. The general's new plan has hit them hard here, and we are engaged at the Lyceum Theatre till the 1st of May, and perhaps longer. We give three performances per day at Egyptian Hall and go after 9 o'clock to the theatre. We average altogether 60 pounds per day. Not bad, all things considered. Not bad is right, and it appears that business skyrocketed in a matter of days. By April 3rd, Barnum was reporting to other correspondents that he was bringing in $500 per day from the Egyptian Hall levies, and their share of profits from the performances at the Lyceum Theater amounted to $200 per night, thus a total of $700 per day. Further, Barnum noted, they were frequently turning away 500 to 800 people who wanted to attend the evening levies at Egyptian Hall. Barnum swore to Mr. West, one of the editors of the New York Atlas newspaper, that these statistics, as he called them, were true upon his honor and could reliably be published in an article. 
By comparison, Barnum's March 31st recounting of financial success to Hitchcock seems modest. Little did he know that he would be further tested by the desire to keep piling up the tin when he explained his conflicting emotions to Hitchcock. Our business continues very prosperous, and I am ashamed to say the temptation here is now so great in a pecuniary point of view that we have almost resolved not to leave England till August. But God Almighty knows that if my life is spared, you shall see us in New York before the 10th of September next. I would not stay longer for the whole of England. You cannot hardly imagine with what anxiety I await the arrival of the next steamer, which will bring me the news of my family. In fact, his plan was for General Tom Thumb and his father Sherwood Stratton, along with the entourage, to remain in London continuing the performances while he made the surprise visit home. Barnum's letter to My Dear Friend Captain Matthews requests berths on the SS Great Western. Reading between the lines hints at how Barnum intended to make his absence palatable to partner Stratton, who had expressed great displeasure even about the few days Barnum was absent from France when he went to make advance arrangements in London. The letter to Captain Matthews begins, I wish to engage two of the best berths in your ship for the 11th April for Mrs. Stratton, the mother of General Tom Thumb, and for her brother. She goes to America on a visit. The general himself does not go till August. She wants a lower berth in the middle of the ship down below. He went on to say, The gentleman wants an upper berth in the best part of the ship, wherever that is, and I leave it to you to select it. Then he burst out with the truth that the brother of Mrs. Stratton was fictitious. By the way, for fear you may not select the best, I'll tell you the truth who it is. It is myself. Explaining the pretense, he continued, I thought at first that I would not tell you that I was going, for I want to take our folks in America all by surprise, and I was fearful that you would mention it and the news would get over to America by the steamer of the 4th. But I beg you will not mention it for I want the fun of surprising our people the other side of the water. So please, keep dark. Barnum would thus be accompanying Cynthia Stratton on the voyage. We can imagine she was as anxious as Barnum to see family and friends again, and since her husband would probably not have wished nor allowed her to travel alone, Barnum's presence remedied that issue. She and Barnum would leave London and start for Liverpool on Thursday night, April 9th, the day before Good Friday, and the steamship would depart on Saturday. Barnum would also be bringing new chromatrope views for Hitchcock to use in the American Museum, but he deceived him by saying only that he was sending them on Great Western. Which leaves 11th April and will arrive about the 26th, I suppose. Failing to mention that he himself would also be on board. Great Western was a British vessel built between 1837 and 1838 for the purpose of making transatlantic crossings. Although she was only in service for a few years, she was famous for attaining record speeds in the ocean crossings and averaged 16 days from England to the U.S. and about 13 and a half days on the return voyage. Boasting four masts for auxiliary sails and two side paddle wheels, she was also the largest passenger ship in the world until 1840. Her design by Ishmael Kingdom Brunel was so innovative that she became a model for other Atlantic paddle wheelers. Barnum was thus looking forward to time aboard his top-of-the-line vessel, which was very well appointed for first-class travelers such as himself. Barnum requested of Captain Matthews, Please, give me such a berth as you think will be most comfortable, and if you are not full, I hope I shall not have a partner in the stateroom. However, if I must, I must. In other words, private accommodation was preferred. As far as Mrs. Stratton, Barnum had never before expressed any liking, much less admiration, for her, and in fact he poked fun at her foolishness, vanity, and seemingly willful ignorance. But in a letter to Charity on April 2nd, written in part to mislead her about the timing of his return, Barnum remarked on the change in Mrs. Stratton. He noted, She has quite reformed her temper, etc., and now speaks of you in terms of the greatest kindness. She says that when she comes home in July next, she hopes to be able to visit with you and have you do the same with her. Indeed, she has become so much improved in disposition that I shall not regret to see a reconciliation on her return. More importantly, he told Charity, Words cannot express the anxiety which I feel in relation to your health, nor how slowly the moments pass as I think of home and of the twelve days which must yet elapse before I can hear from you. God in mercy grant that you have got along well, 
and that you may speedily recover your health. Whatever may be the event, I certainly can never forgive myself for so cruelly allowing anything to cause me to be absent from you on such a fearful occasion as that which I trust you have now safely passed. Barnum also asked Charity to have his sister Cordelia write at once to the Barnum's eldest daughter Caroline at school in Washington, D.C., for Caroline had made a mistake in sending out her letters. He relayed, I got a letter from Caroline by the last steamer, but unfortunately she was so careless in addressing her letters that she sent me one which she had written to yourself and Miss Susan Doane, and of course I suppose that the letter intended for me was sent to you. However, I heard from her and learned that she was in good health and spirits, and that is the most important thing. Uncle Allenson Taylor, having moved to Baltimore, had also paid a visit to Caroline at her boarding school. Barnum appreciated his uncle's effort, offering, Many, many thanks for your calling on my daughter Caroline and the good report you gave of her progress. As far as little Helen at home with her mother in Bridgeport, Barnum once again promised to write his six-year-old, saying it would be a magnificent letter and that he would send her some beautiful presents by an acquaintance of Mr. and Mrs. Osborne's who goes over by the Great Western. Not actually a lie, since he was the acquaintance, but he was clearly aiming to pull the wool over his young daughter's eyes. Moses Kimball, Barnum's showman friend in Boston, was the one person in America to whom he confided that he would soon be returning to the States. On April 3rd, Barnum penned a letter to Kimball from Egyptian Hall in London, divulging his plan. I am about to entrust you with a small secret, and as no other person the other side of the Atlantic will know it, I have only to say I beg you not to hint or breathe it to a living being. The secret, he said, is this. I leave here next Saturday, 11th April, by the Great Western, and with God's blessing will be in New York about 25th or 26th instant. I go only for a visit of three or four weeks, and hope therefore you will not fail to call to New York and spend all the time you can. I would not for a 50-pound note miss of taking Hitchcock and all our folks by surprise, so for heaven's sake, be discreet. He added that he still knew nothing about Charity's confinement and the arrival of their baby, and would have to wait another three weeks until he was in New York to find out. I have not yet heard of my wife's accouchement, nor shall not till I arrive. Hitchcock, meanwhile, had been given instructions to keep trying to think of everything which will be attractive to the museum, and write me speedily, so that I can be providing it during the summer. Barnum advised him, As I cannot probably get Hale the Giant, we must make as much noise as possible out of what we can get. I have therefore shipped the fat children, and hope that you will be able to make a big card of them. Their transatlantic journey would be far longer and more arduous than Barnum's, for he noted that they had departed Glasgow on March 27th aboard Saracen with Captain Hawkins, and I suppose you may reasonably expect them about the 15th of May, perhaps a little earlier. That's seven weeks, in contrast to 16 days on Great Western. Saracen was among the many Irish immigrant ships bringing victims of the Great Famine to America, and though most of these vessels were very sturdy and made the crossing safely, conditions for the passengers were a far cry from the comfort and speed of a steamer. Barnum had deputized Glasgow showman David Prince Miller to manage the travel arrangements for the fat children and their mother and siblings, and one would hope he had investigated to learn if Saracen was a seaworthy vessel, with ample supplies for the passengers. While Barnum, Cynthia Stratton, and the Scottish family were crossing the ocean, General Tom Thumb would continue to hit them hard in London with the new play. As Barnum made a point of telling Editor West, General Tom Thumb was never so popular here as at the present moment. He proudly declared, We are going it after the biggest fashion, and asked that West let the American public know, I am not staying here so long for nothing. We hope you're enjoying the episode. If you want to support us, consider subscribing to our podcast and leaving us a review. It really helps us out. Now, let's dive into the next segment, Unexpected News. Given the nature of a copybook, it shouldn't be surprising that as we get to the end of Barnum's copybook, we are left with some mysteries, which is to say, unfinished stories. Barnum didn't always need to explain what his correspondents already knew, 
So we as outsiders are left with some unanswered questions. The copybook begins mid-letter in July of 1845, so there must have been a preceding volume, and it ends with a few letters of scattered dates between late April 1846, when Barnum was on a return visit to America, and August 1846, when he was back in the United Kingdom once again. He probably started a new copybook at that point. Even though the Barnum Museum's copybook lacks a proper beginning and the last letters in the book leave us with gaps in time, Everything in between has proven exceedingly rich with stories and offers context that we can draw upon for the conclusion. The paucity of letters from the summer of 1846 is due in part to Barnum's return visit to America, since he would have been meeting in person with his manager in New York, and, as we learned from a letter to Moses Kimball, Barnum expected his friend to come from Boston so they could catch up. But that may not entirely be the reason. Since Barnum's visit home was to have been a short one, and he expected to sail in early or mid-June, he was probably in England again from at least July onward, though there are no letters dating from that month. And despite General Tom Thumb's phenomenal success in London during Barnum's absence, Barnum likely returned to England with a heavy heart in regard to his own family matters, and that may account for the silence. We can piece together some of the whys and wherefores, though certain facts and incidents may be unknowable. Nonetheless, we will do our best to investigate one of these mysteries in this episode. As we've heard repeatedly from Barnum, he was returning home in a state of great anxiety, not knowing if his wife had been safely delivered of their child, nor if the baby was healthy and had survived. Astonishingly, no one had written to tell him. One might assume that once Barnum reached home, he promptly wrote to the close friends in England who also shared his concern. If so, such letters were not penned into this copybook. A letter of May 14th written to Charles Stratton from Bridgeport, Connecticut, suggests Barnum might have sent such messages at the end of April or in early May, because he remarked, I have not much news since the last steamer left. The news he did share in his letter of the 14th says nothing about the baby, relating only that Charity had not recovered her health and vitality since giving birth on March 1st. In fact, this brief letter is the last one in the copybook to mention charity, and there are none at all mentioning Pauline's birth. Barnum communicated to eight-year-old Charles in a surprisingly adult voice. My wife continues in very bad health. She does not go out of the house except for a short ride in a carriage two or three times a week. I think she will be in good health soon, and I shall come to London as soon as possible. I shall probably start on the 1st of June, but perhaps I cannot go so soon on account of my wife's health and my business here. But if not, I shall certainly start the 16th of June and arrive in London 30th of June. Charles was like a son to him, and he closed the note with the hope that the boy would enjoy himself well and study his lessons all the time, adding, I wish to see you very much. I think of you day and night. Two and a half weeks before this, while still at sea on the steamer Great Western, Barnum had penned a letter to his uncle Allenson Taylor, telling him he expected to arrive in two days, on April 28th. Taylor was at that point one of only two people aware of Barnum's imminent return. Since Taylor was living in Baltimore managing their new enterprise, the former Peel's Museum, Barnum asked his uncle to be in touch with daughter Caroline, attending a boarding school in Washington, D.C. He entreated him, have the goodness to write to my Caroline and say that I shall call in a few days to take her home for a fortnight holiday. I do not know her address. In addition to that message, Barnum once again expressed his worries about charity, though without even knowing her situation, he had determined that his visit home would be for only one month, and his time in Baltimore must therefore be limited to one day and one night. Despite such a brief time, he hoped to be able to fully comprehend your proposed alterations to the museum building. And he also asked his uncle to draw up the frame of an article of agreement which shall hereafter exist between us. Once Barnum had this draft in hand, he would take it to a lawyer in New York to have the article properly prepared in duplicate, and where also I will make over to you one half of the Baltimore Museum. Taylor was then to meet him in New York to sign the papers. So that was the plan Barnum laid out, though it does not seem to have been executed. We'll return to that point, since that is part of the mystery. Barnum also related that he was bringing an exotic animal with him, 
a specimen he had purchased for the benefit of both the New York and Baltimore museums. He told Taylor, You can have it, no doubt, within a fortnight if you wish. This orang utang as he called it, is not quite so large, I think, as one they have had at my museum, which died, but she is a very fine specimen, and is at present in excellent health. Still, they are very liable to die, and I hesitated much about buying her, lest she should die before my arrival. I have now great hopes that she will live several months, and if so, I think she will pay well. He informed Taylor that the orangutan had cost him 120 pounds, or $600, but he had only paid 100 pounds in cash, and the balance would be paid at the end of four months, but only if she was still alive. Promoting her quickly would be key, since she might not live long, and to that end, Barnum used his knowledge of the newspaper business to help his uncle get some free advertising. Sending him copies of the Liverpool Chronicle, which I hope you will make the best use of possible with all your papers in Baltimore, he explained, The editors will all be glad to get the latest paper from England, and will not therefore hesitate about inserting the paragraph about the chimpanzee or African orangutan which I have on board. Another possible attraction Barnum offered his uncle was a play, a very funny farce, called Did You Ever Send Your Wife to Cumberwell? Since it was brand new and not yet published, he had paid a guinea to have the manuscript copied and was sending that to Taylor. Written by Joseph Sterling Coyne, the play first opened at the Adelphi Theatre in London on March 16, 1846. Observing, It has created more fun in London than any piece played there this ten years, Barnum acknowledged that it might not be in your line, and if so, to send it back to the American Museum, where he would then sell it to Mitchell of the Olympic Theatre. Barnum had also purchased playbooks for a few other recent plays. Since they were published works, they had only cost him only six pence apiece. He would send or bring them to Taylor. This letter validates Barnum's commitment to making the Baltimore Museum a success, as well as cementing the partnership with his uncle, who had so determinedly gone about acquiring the concern unbeknownst to Barnum. But their endeavor had barely gotten off the ground when tragedy struck and that event happened either while Barnum was still in America or soon after he boarded the steamship returning to England. His beloved, if contrary uncle, died. The date of his death was probably June 5th, though one source says May 6th, and another source states June 6th, 1846. The May date is highly unlikely, since Barnum did not mention Taylor in his letter to Charles on the 14th. The Congregational Church in Bethel, Connecticut, records the date of Taylor's death as June 5, 1846, and his age as 44 years, 10 months, and 3 days, which would make his birth date August 2, 1801. He was only nine years older than Barnum, to whom he became legal guardian after Barnum's father died. Though the two had very different views on religion and doubtless on many other topics, Barnum remained loyal to his uncle, grateful for his support in lean times years before. Despite moments of exasperation, Barnum always wanted him to succeed, and he was surely sensitive to his uncle and aunt's losses, both personal ones and financial troubles. Allenson Taylor and his wife Rebecca had suffered the deaths of three of their five children. Two daughters, both named Almira, passed in 1832 and 1837, and their seven-year-old son Alonzo died in 1841. Barnum once commented to Fortis Hitchcock that his uncle has been a disappointed and broken-spirited man, and so might be forgiven for his peculiarities. That Taylor himself seems to have died quite suddenly at age 44 must have been a shock to Barnum. His uncle had last written to him on February 27th, and Barnum responded promptly on March 18th. Since Barnum and Hitchcock corresponded as frequently as transatlantic mail allowed, Hitchcock would undoubtedly have informed Barnum if he knew that Taylor was unwell and could no longer manage the Baltimore Museum. While we have been unable at this point to learn the cause of Allenson Taylor's death, probate court documents about the settling of his estate offer insights into his financial situation at the time of his death. Barnum's name appears on one of these documents as a creditor, though not for the $5,000 sum that he had originally loaned Taylor for the purpose of becoming a partner with Mr. Wheeler in the cloth business. The earliest of the court documents is dated June 8th, three days after Taylor's apparent death date. 
A court order of June 15th states that Thomas B. Fanton, the judge of probate for the District of Reading, would be acting in the case since Edward Taylor, the judge of probate for the District of Danbury, which included Taylor's hometown, Bethel, was closely related to the deceased and thus deemed incapable or disqualified by law to act in this case. Edward Taylor and Oliver Shepard were appointed as administrators of the goods, chattels, credits, and estate. Timothy B. Hickok and George Clapp were thereafter sworn in as commissioners to receive, examine, and adjust the claims of the several creditors of the estate. They were ordered to post notices on the public signpost in Danbury and in a newspaper published in Fairfield County stating when and where they would receive and examine the claims. Six months were allowed for creditors to prove their claims, thus imposing a December deadline. So back in those days, the settling of an estate involved making a complete inventory of the deceased's possessions, as well as any real estate they owned or had an interest in. Clapp and Hickok were appointed as appraisers to make the inventory and to place a value on each item or piece of property, and this they did on July 4, 1846. If you are not familiar with early household inventories, we should explain that they include virtually every movable thing in a household and its outbuildings, including stores of food like flour and potatoes. Exceptions would be, for example, items specifically owned by the widow, such as her clothing and household items she brought to the marriage as part of her dowry. Aside from those things, coats, shoes, boots, hats, every piece of furniture, bedding, towels and tablecloths, dishes, utensils and cookware, water pails, fire tongs, and so on, were all itemized and assigned a value. Even broken and seemingly trivial items can be included in these inventories, though necessary items like chamber pots are generally absent. Compared to what most people own today, ordinary households of that time functioned with far, far fewer items, and most people owned very little in the way of clothing. Allenson Taylor, for example, owned one pair of boots and one pair of shoes, a cloak, an overcoat, two dress coats, two thin coats, and a frock coat. He had one striped silk vest, a black silk velvet vest, another vest, and three pairs of black pantaloons. And he had a hat. Interestingly, he also owned a wig, a costly item that was valued at $4. Perhaps he had inherited it from his father, since men were not commonly wearing wigs in the early 1800s. His most valuable possession, more valuable by far than anything else in the household, was his watch and chain appraised at $60. By comparison, his overcoat was valued at $6 and one of his dress coats at $8, while the other dress coat was just $1.50. The total value of all household goods and clothing amounted to just $247.37. On April 1, 1847, the court prepared an order of sale since it had been determined that the estate was insolvent based on the creditor claims, that document stated that all the estate, both real and personal, and except the widow's right of dower, was to be sold either at a private sale for not less than the inventory prices or at public sale. As noted, the legal right of dower gave some protection to the widow, meaning that a certain portion of the possessions were set aside for her. Sadly, the majority of her familiar household items would be sold, in this case along with her husband's valuable watch and chain. So, that's what happened. Among the court documents is a list of the items Rebecca Taylor was allowed to retain, and it was more generous than many such apportionments to a widow. She was able to keep the bedding and a substantial portion of the furniture, table linens, dishes, and household equipment, such as cooking and fireplace tools, and a wash tub, plus her husband's clothing. She was also able to keep one large and one small Bible, Bibles were often used to record births, marriages, and deaths in the family, so these could have contained genealogical information only useful to the family. The value of things she could keep totaled $157.50. The real estate was sold on April 28, 1847, according to one of the administrator's expense accounts. Allenson Taylor had owned half of the home and garden, his half valued at $1,000, plus a barn at $50 and store at $150 and some acreage in a couple of locations. 
the total of all real estate amounted to $1,675. For many people at that time, all of this would represent a fair sum, but it was insufficient to cover Taylor's debts. As with the household goods, Rebecca received a widow's right of dower in one of the properties, the small sum of $8.71 from five acres on Hoyt's Hill, valued at $50 per acre. A list of the sums due from Taylor's estate was presented to the court on December 29, 1846. Barnum and one other man had brought claims for privileged debts, which, as the name implies, superseded all other claims. These were both quite modest, at just $16 and $8. Seven individuals held notes against Taylor. Barnum's was the largest of them, at $1,406.73. Four book debts were claimed, and again Barnum's was the largest at $742.25. Following these, there is another claim by Barnum, but the heading describing this single claim is difficult to make out, Debt by error in E meant is the best we can determine. It was a considerable amount at $1,011.34. The total of all claims against Allenson Taylor's estate was $4,733.22, but the appraised value of the household items to be sold, along with the value of the real estate, amounted to just $1,765, so about $3,000 short of what was needed. Of course, there must be more to the story of Allenson and Rebecca Taylor than court documents reveal, but the information contained in them give us some insights into the lives of ordinary people in a rural New England town, a world that Barnum had left behind when he left Bethel and moved to New York City. Barnum's family was not poor by the standards of the time, but the security of one's fortune of any size and life itself were especially unpredictable then, as the death of Allenson Taylor and his insolvency demonstrate. Knowing as we do from the copybook letters that Barnum often helped friends and family in need, one wonders whether he made it possible for Rebecca to stay in her home. Certainly, Barnum's financial claims against his uncle could not have been met, but the documents do not show how much money was distributed to any of the creditors, although there are accounts detailing each of the administrator's expenses. A question that emerges from this, was it necessary for Barnum to submit his claims, knowing of his uncle's precarious financial state? By 1860, when Rebecca Taylor was 60 years old, she was living with her daughter Julia's family in Bethel. Julia had married Jonathan B. Clapp, and they had several children. Her other daughter, Sarah, was married to William Hickok, and they too lived in Bethel. One hopes it was a consolation for Rebecca to have her daughters close, and have the support of her immediate family. One of the questions we are left with concerns the timing of Allenson Taylor's death relative to Barnum's visit home, and what happened with the document Barnum intended to have prepared that would have given Taylor an equal interest in the Baltimore Museum. If it had been drawn up and signed, would Rebecca's life as a widow have been very different? Perhaps not, even if Rebecca had been left with financial resources, it would be the norm for a widow to live in the household of one of her married children. Considering the work involved in everyday chores, food processing, cooking, keeping a house warm, doing laundry, and so on, it would be much more efficient for her to live in a household where tasks were shared. And not having the benefit of things like a telephone, radio, or television to ease loneliness, living by oneself in a house could be hard. Barnum's expression of empathy toward the Taylors, knowing of their loss of three children and their financial troubles, suggests he would have wanted to help Rebecca as he had done when he learned that his widowed sister Cordelia became impoverished. Barnum felt a strong obligation to his uncle for the support he'd given him as a young man, and his feeling would surely have extended to his uncle's widow. After Taylor's death, Barnum chose not to keep the museum in Baltimore. According to his autobiography, he soon sold it to the Orphean family. Considering how desirous he had been to own museums in various U.S. cities, that sale is a bit puzzling, although his need to return to England, coupled with his own domestic worries, might have led to the decision. Keeping the Baltimore Museum at a complicated time in his life may have felt like one too many irons in the fire, as well as a sad reminder of the unexpected death of his uncle. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of Becoming Barnum, The Journey to Fame and Fortune. Support for this episode is provided by the City of Bridgeport American Rescue Plan Act Funds, Peoples United, a division of M&T Bank, and the Connecticut Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities. The podcast was produced by the Barnum Museum and based on the blog series Barnum's Letters from Abroad by Adrian St. Pierre. Editing and sound design are by Rui Pinna, and narration is by William Saris. Kathleen Marr is our executive director, and John Swing is our COO. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast and visit our YouTube channel for behind-the-scenes presentations of our collections and more stories about the legendary showman. Connect with us on social media and let us know what you think. Please tune in next time as we continue our adventures with P.T. Barnum.